Welcome to Watching Silent Films Podcast. My name is Zifong, and with me are my co-host Bob and Lily. And today we have a guest, uh, uh, last last week's guest actually, Diane, and she's back. So Welcome say back. hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hey, hey. Greetings. Welcome back, days. Diane. Yes, and uh, per last week's Thank episode, uh, we're going to talk about uh, The Thief of Baghdad, the 1924 Douglas Fairbank. Another swashbuckling adventure, twice in a, in a row. Must be a record for us. <laughs> <laughs> two adventure movies in two weeks. So that's our primary uh, feature uh, discussion. And um, so uh, welcome back, Lily. And um, so before we get there, I just wanted to... Uh, and by the way, the purpose of this podcast is to uh, uh, pick a movie, watch it, and discuss it. And if I already mentioned that. But um, so that's what we do. And um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, listeners, uh, leaving uh, you know comments on our Apple Podcast page would help us uh, trend up a little bit and uh, allow us to be visible on if they do like you know top podcast charts and stuff like that. So um, if you enjoy this podcast and you like what we do, please leave uh, a star rating. And or a better one is to write a review on those uh, podcast platforms, either there or any other platform you can find us. You can fi find us pretty, pretty much anywhere that podcast can be found. And uh, you can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. And you can email us at watchingsilentfilmsplural at uh, gmail.com. And so before we get started, we just want to do a quick uh, what we've been watching. Uh, we'll start with you, Lily. Did have you had, I know you've been having a busy week there, but did you get any chance to watch anything in the classic realm? Uh, I mean, no, but I watched two movies get made. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, wow. From the other side. <laughs> From the other side, but yeah. more up to date, not quite a passive, you know, we're in the classical realm, so. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. There'll be classics one day. Yeah. P possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in them? I, I was helping out on the set so i was doing lighting for one I and see. a production assistant on the other i see do you ever do acting not recently i so i know we haven't really seen each other in person half of my head is shaved so i need a new headshot so oh <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> it, and i look like a boy from half the side depending on the angle so it's kind of rough now oh. that i'm noticing it <laughs> what's that what's that uh, was there a reason for that besides uh, fashion, or is that something you wanted to do? No, I thought it looked cool, and my younger neighbors think I look like a rock star, so I was like, heck yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, I did it just because, I don't know, something. I can't braid. I never learned how to do any of that you know, growing <laughs> up, so I can't, I'm not like a girl when it comes to hair. I throw it in a ponytail or leave it down. Boring. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know what I mean, so I was like, let's just shave half of it off. Why not? I mean, <laughs> those, uh, you could do those movies. Um, what What's it called? Uh, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. You seen those movies? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the yeah, Swedish those version. I still want to see it with uh, Numi Rapace, even though yeah. I've read all the books. They're excellent. Really? Well, mm -hmm. if you read them, then you know. You, make sure you check out the extended edition because those are Ooh. those are the uncut versions. But anyway, <laughs> Bob or Diane? Diane? Um, all my hair is on my head. <laughs> 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 but uh right now i'm tapped into uh our film today i've been doing a lot of work on the website and um that's i just mean since last podcast focus. did you did you check anything else since our last podcast no well okay. i did watch the entire thief of baghdad which is a pretty long film mm -hmm. i wanted to be prepared today Cool. Uh, I don't. I think Bob left by the time we were done, and I ordered Hugo and the artist, and I haven't gotten them yet, but I'm looking very forward to seeing them on your recommendations. Excellent. Excellent. You'll love them. They're classics for sure. How about you, Bob? Classic. Yeah, modern classic. That's right. Yeah. Um. Monday, oh no, not Monday, um, yesterday, watched with my brother, The Lady Vanishes. Oh, I have that VHS Ooh. in my other room. <laughs> <laughs> I 
it's I love it. I, I I love it a lot. It's a nice movie. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene I don't understand in it, but I'm going to ask online to give me an answer to that. Maybe one of you, do do either of you know it really well? No, I've been wanting to watch it because I actually still have a VHS slash DVD player, but it has some mold in it. So I'm de- I've been debating on if I should attempt to put it in the VHS slot. <laughs> I don't know if it'll actually do anything. I mean, I haven't used it for years. I just use it for the DVD part now. They they do. Uh, if you keep a, an eye, uh, Lily, on your local uh, Craigslist type places uh, online, they give mm-hmm. like people are just getting rid of VCRs left and right. Yeah. As soon as you hear one, you just go and grab mm-hmm. it. And you can like wipe it down with Clorox. But other than that, you, it should be. That's how I got my. What, I mean, that's how I got my VCR because I, I, before this podcast started, I, um, I knew that there's a possibility where we would need to, you know, I knew I would need to get uh, a movie off of the, our local library, which, mm-hmm. shockingly or not, I guess, has a huge amount of VHS tapes. I don't know if you guys know that. <clears throat> so you can actually request it through your library and uh and certain silent films uh or even classic films are only available on vhs hmm. um as far as i know they're not uh legitimately available on db until uh, unless some pirate duped a copy from uh vhs and digitized it and then uh try to you know sell it on dvd but like um uh, lillian gish the wind I, I don't that that's been on vhs for example but it has never been on DVD officially that I'm aware of. Mm. So that would be like they a classic. They have it on TCM. Right. But if well, you want to get a copy of it, right? So. Well, Lily, when you do oh, see no, it. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> when you do see that, Lily, let me know. And uh, I have a neat little storyline question for you that might that might you might find interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I have been wanting to watch it. Just at, like that, my library isn't taking VHS tapes anymore. Probably because they realize no one has one. I mean, of course I do. I <laughs> my whole house is older. You know, everything in my house is over thirty years old. I'm 28, and everything has been here since the fi- friggin' 50s. So mm-hmm. it hasn't been updated since the 80s, at least. So it's like no wonder I have. A VHS and DVD player. Well, it's not your local <laughs> library, but you, you got to use your network. You know, like, you, you log in and then you can request things through your network. And it's through your network that you can get all these things. Oh, yeah. CW Mars, you mean, right? Whichever one. They're all connected. Yeah. Everything that in, in mass, at least, is all connected. And so y- you can actually, there is actually even a way I've I found out that you can actually, if you go in person or call, you can actually even request things outside of Massachusetts from super far away if you Ooh. are a- are able to. It's a it's a pretty neat feature. But anyway, long story short is that some library out there is still keeping some amount of VHS, and that's where sometimes you can get lucky and and find a copy of a, a silent film or some classic realm uh, tape that you know that that just doesn't exist, right? You know, somebody hadn't tossed it on YouTube yet and stuff like that. So yeah. Anyways. So that's where we're at. So other than the Lady Vanishes uh uh Hitchcock movie, uh, did you catch anything else, Bob? No, that's it. That's it. Okay. That's a good one. Oh, all of almost all of Hitchcock's are classics. Right. So we'll have to we'll have to catch one of those there his uh we'll have to watch his uh what's it called? Hitchcock nine or something? Yeah. Like nine, Silent films that he made. Since you mentioned it, I, I mentioned to my brother and that he did some silent films, and my brother was very curious about that. So I was like, really? "Yeah." I said, "I said, well, we'll see if I can I can locate them and we'll watch them." So some of them might be on. Blackmail uh, is a very good film. Blackmail. Blackmail. Yeah. Cool. Part silent, part sound. Very cool. Yeah, they just did a. Um, there's been there's a, I don't know. You see, the library isn't totally opened up yet, but they did release the nine. Um, that, that's what they call the Hitchcock nine. Most most of it is, is is already lost, unfortunately. But what what survives is nine films, and like the Lodger, I think, is one of them. And uh, 
you can get them on a collection and then uh, they restored it and clean up the film prints and restore mm -hmm. it. So Today I listened to an, art, um, an interview with Hitchcock actually. On YouTube? I don't. I don't even remember where I heard it. I think it was on YouTube. I, I just linked to it when I saw it, and uh, it was it was just very interesting. I I, ac I actually came across it accidentally, and uh, but it was but it was excellent. I mean, just it was Hitchcock was talking about his way of making films, and he said basically the things I expected him to say. Because actually, I kind of know Hitchcock's way pretty well. So yeah. <laughs> um, he talked about um, his his way of anticipating what the audience would ask and making sure that he doesn't give it to them that or they, what, they, <laughs> what they what they're expecting you know and he says no 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 you can never it can never be what they expect <laughs> yeah, he's uh he's quite the artist let's put it that way it's pretty yeah. amazing he does a lot of storyboards and Basis is films on these storyboards, and what I thought was interesting is that the movie that we're going to be discussing today, The Thief of Baghdad, is that with that's the same approach that Douglas Fairbanks took with his films, at least this one in particular. Mm. A lot of storyboards, a lot of architectural perspectives. It's a huge, huge film. Yeah, I mean, um, that's that's uh, Hitchcock is uh, interesting because he he makes the movies in pre-production and he finds the actual filming pretty boring because in his mind, he already finished his movie in pre-production, both the mm -hmm. storyboards, the screenwriting, everything is already done. So when he's on yeah. set, he's super bored. He's just like, oh, that's the construction. I got to film the <laughs> actor. I got to do all this. And then, you know, he completes the edit and he's done. So. That's kind of the way he works. But anyways, no, that's a good segue, uh, Diane. Let's move into the, the, the main feature. Um, Douglas Fairbanks, The Thief of Baghdad, 1924. It's directed by Raul Walsh. Um, and well, it's credited to Ahmed Abdullah and a lot of woods. But as we all know, it's, you know, sometimes they get credited, but it's really the driving force is, you know, Douglas Fairbanks, right? And you put the mm. package together and made these movies. Um, but Raul Walsh is, uh, what do you know about Raul Walsh, uh, Diane? <laughs> he, I think he's a magnificent director. He's a very strong personality. Uh, he began as an actor, um, but he shifted into her direction around 1915. Um, and it was an accident that he had in uh, 1931 that forced him to get off the screen. Very handsome man, but he lost an eye in an accident, and so that put him in an eye patch. And uh, just a tough guy. I think that he and Fairbanks probably got along very well. Yeah, it seems to be part of the whole big boys club, right? When it comes to directing, along with John Ford, oh, all yeah. kind of hang, hung around with each other. Sort of the whole like, you know, man's man and all that. In fact, he is one of the guy, he, I think he's either directly or indirectly uh, discovered John Wayne, as I recall, because John Wayne was working as a assistant or something like that on John Ford sets. So they knew of each other with John Ford and when John Ford was making silence and shorts. But it was actually Raul Walsh who was like, hey, you, what, what are you doing? And it was like, it's almost like the same story with Harrison Ford and George Lucas. They just threw him in the movie. Mm -hmm. So That'd be interesting, like a depiction based on his like Rooster Coghorn in the, uh, what the what's the film True that grit. was remade? True Grit, yeah, with the eye patch, because I think it's over the same eye. <laughs> yeah. If it was like some kind of, I don't know, maybe he based it off of Raul like mm. i don't know don't know but uh i will say that uh i mean the the the, the movies he's directed uh, you know the big trail again john wayne high sierra uh white heat i mean just massive giant of you know cinema 
I mean, there's, there's, there's so many with Errol Flynn and so many with uh, me West, just, you know, work with some of the greatest uh, actors and actresses of all time. Uh, and there was a little offbeat story about Ronald Walsh. He was asked to put his footprints in Grauman's Chinese theater. So what he did, instead of putting his handprints, he took his fist and he slammed it in the uh, concrete and wrote his mark. <laughs> I feel like I saw <laughs> that when I went. <laughs> yep. So, yep. So that's the guy that uh, ended up uh, directing this. And um, so let's start with... Uh, the, the the let's start with uh Diane, do you know how uh Douglas Fairbanks came upon this story or the inception of how this whole how he got into making this film from the start? Other than his you know interest in these You know, classics. to be honest with you, I'm not sure of the backstory on this particular film. But um I believe that his storylines with United Artists just got bigger with their productions and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this was the biggest, and in my opinion, the most beautiful of all his productions that he made with United Artists. And it's a fascinating story, which gave him a lot of room to do his Fairbanks thing. Yeah, I mean, his uh, son, is often interviewed uh, at Douglas Fairbanks Jr. As, say, as saying that his dad, which is Douglas Fairbanks, uh, would often say that this is his greatest work of all his other movies. Hmm. Um, the uh, biographer for Fairbanks, uh, Jeffrey Vance, says, uh, let's see, what did he write? And I quote, uh, an epic romantic fantasy adventure inspired by several of the Arabian Nights tale, The Thief of Baghdad is the greatest artistic triumph of uh, Fairbanks' career. The super visual design, spectacle, imaginative splendor, his visual effects, along with his bravura performance, leading a cast of literally thousands, all contribute to making this his masterpiece. So he would he would often uh, come back and say, this is one of his, if not his favorite, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, the budget Maybe. was a million, around a million, and it made about one and a half or two, two times that back. So go ahead, Diane. It, it worth saying that his designer for the sets was not credited in the film, but it was William Cameron Menzies who created these incredible sets that were a combination of designs from uh, um, Art Deco, um, Middle Eastern, mm -hmm. um, just massive sets that he had lots of room to play in. And uh, that's part of the magic of this film are the sets. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's one of the, I mean, certainly is part of it, but I feel like the whole package as a whole, you really don't feel the two and a half hours. It depends no. on, you know, how you watch it, I guess. If you're tired, it's, you know, Lily, you might have been tired watching that, but <laughs> but yeah, I I had to do it on speed it up a lot because yeah. I at the end we we're getting I yeah like the last hour I actually sped it up because I was worried I wasn't gonna have it done in time for the podcast because I mm -hmm. you know I I only really just got back to normal like <laughs> weeks today so I was like yeah, okay yeah. I gotta watch this movie and it That's wasn't bad one. but it it yeah. <laughs> It's kind of like the blockbuster of its day. So, like today, we have like you know easy examples are like those Avenger movies or the Marvel movies, which you mm -hmm. know the last one was like almost three hours or something, which a lot of people you know can accept because you know they're the modern entertainment of our days. But effectively, the Thief of Baghdad was kind of like those Marvel spectacles uh, of its time, right in the twenties, and. Um, if you look back at the context, it's actually one of many. It, it, there seems to be a lot of films, even in the 19 teens. You know, they just uh, they went for the spectacles, especially the uh, the Italian ones. So, 
so you can get moody jet lag. Is that what it was, Lily? Store a little moody jet lag for you? A little, a little bit. Sorry, there's a whole bunch of rumble, uh, th thunder rumbling above me, so I have to mute the microphone. It's really loud. <laughs> um, I mean, you can tell it's obviously this amazing spectacle. It just seems very slow every every move it was almost like watching a dance recital in ballet everything was slow motion you know douglas fairbanks has these grand gestures and it's like the acting still hasn't caught up to him with like you don't have to be so expressive mm -hmm. even though it is a silent film so i was like mm -hmm. what is this dude doing because <laughs> uh i never got a chance to even watch the marco zorro either which i still want to see but, you know, watching this first, I was like, uh, <laughs> but, you know, that was how it was at that time. So I can't complain. That's its context. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really his uh, we were we talked about last week. He's, you know, similar kind of way in in uh, Marcus Zorro and that he's got a puckish thing, which is uh where is that from puck what's the character of puck from shakespeare Midsummer, I mean, Midsummer. Yeah. that's right so so like if you know the the play you know puck is just this very mischievous just uh yeah he was a fairy or something like that. he's some sort of creature he's a fairy, mm -hmm. he's a fairy. He's, yeah he's a creature where he's totally mischievous and he winks at you at the audience and he, he knows what's going to go and, and i think that's kind of douglas fairbanks in a nutshell he's kind of like uh a force unto himself i'd say uh, oh, okay. I, I don't think he's trying to like copy other people's acting. Or do, I mean, maybe I don't know, but it, it, you know, there have been other actors and and things we've seen in other movies where they take it more seriously. It's a more subtle acting, right? I don't think we've <clears throat> tackled a lot of Lillian Gish yet, but she'd be a good example of doing some pretty advanced acting even in the silent film days, you know. But anyway, long story short mm. is that this is kind of his prototypical style, like you said, for his context. So. But, you know, you'd have to watch more like the Marco Zorro and others like Robin. We watched uh, Robin Hood, actually. Remember Robin mm -hmm. Hood? I think you, you were on that. Oh, yeah, I remember. So that's this kind of very similar acting there. And it's the same stuff here. Um, so it's it's no different in a sense. The the image that he's projecting and, and, the, and the it's sort of like, you know, when you watch like modern movies with Tom Cruise, you're not really watching a character. You're often just seeing. He's Tom Cruise. You're, yeah, exactly. you're paying money to pay to to watch Tom Cruise. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're not just going there. Oh, he's. I mean, he's a good actor, I guess, for action movies. But you know, like the same thing, right? You, you back then, the audiences, you know, they go in there and they want this adventure and swashbuckling. And I mean, he's your man, right? You pay, pay yep. money, and you're there to see the the back then equivalent of. They call him the king of Hollywood, and for a good reason, especially around this time when uh, when the uh, this particular film debuted. But um, this, yeah, um... I think you're spot on with that. You go to see a Douglas Fairbanks film to see Douglas Fairbanks. He doesn't change into a different character. He right. is Douglas Fairbanks, and that's all you need. Yep. Mm. This uh, this film actually has a very special place in my heart, um, because, and it's funny because I until I watched it today, it, it hadn't even occurred to me, but I remembered it so well from when I was a child. Um, I went and saw this at the Davis Square Theater, the Somerville Theater in Somerville, and oh. uh, when I was uh, when I was probably about six years old. Wow. And um my father took me to watch it and I was mesmerized by it. I love it. You get a um, live performance too? Like no, somebody playing? No, oh, okay. it was, no. In fact, I think there was no orchestra or anything. It was just music played with it. So I see. But um but I was amazed. I was amazed. I was it was all magical to me. <laughs> I'm glad you remember that. <laughs> so it, it totally, it totally took me back to feeling like a kid again when I watched it. In fact, I started feeling that way right, very, very early on in the movie. It was like this uh, when he. I remember very well the scene where I remembered it. It was uh, when he used the magic rope when he stole the magic rope. I had the feeling, 
oh, wow, I remember this from when I was a kid. And then when he used the magic rope to climb the wall, I remember that scene so well. And I was like, oh, wow, it's this film, you know? And uh, and when he uh, snuck into the castle and he met the princess and everything, that was etched in my mind as like super, I, I, I don't know the right word for it, but magical, like just. It really brought you back, huh? It did, it did. Wow. You haven't seen it since, though, right? Since you were six? I haven't seen it since. I, I All of a sudden, it just, wham, hit me like a like a ton of bricks. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Oh. Yeah. It shows you the power of silent films, that, that yes. all these years, you know, it, it stayed with you, you know. Yeah, I remember days. coming out of the theater and talking to my dad and saying that was that was so great. And, and he was laughing. And I didn't know why he was laughing, but he was glad that I liked it so much because obviously I'm a little kid and I could like a silent film. And like kids don't have these um, mm, stigmas. I, I I don't know a better word to say, but these uh, these pollutants to their criticisms. You know, they yeah, accept their aversions, completely. aversions to classic. Yeah. Movies. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I'm glad it brought you back. Um... That's something that I occasionally I try to do. Not this specific movie, but uh, the the silent comedies. I often show my kids those, and they they just it's you just sometimes think that you don't know how they're gonna take it, but it's just surprisingly it's pretty broad, you know, the silent comedies especially. Mm. And the more broad it is, the the more that the kids connect with it, and you don't care about all those little details about you know plot and how cheesy things are. They just love that it was entertaining to them. And mm -hmm. the the silent yeah. film comedies, especially, have a rule. They have their own built-in rules and, and onto itself, and so it it tends to stick with you, especially if you watch it young. So yeah, I'm trying to brain brainwash my kids into liking <laughs> silent films. <laughs> well, at least enjoy yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> well, very I mean, impressed, so... Bob. What, what was that, Diane? Oh, I'm very impressed, Bob, that that stayed with you. Oh yeah, it was a yeah, impossible to forget kind of thing. It, yeah, it's not like a you know Chaplin comedy or a Buster Keaton. I mean, that's a big, big film with a lot of things going on. It's funny because I thought about that movie many times during my life, and I never knew what it was. I just remember my dad taking me to watch this movie at the Davis Square Theater and thinking that was so magical. I wish I could figure out what it was, and today I figured it out. <laughs> you were you were today years old until you figured out that that movie was <laughs> The Thief of Baghdad, 1924. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's also cool that you had this uh, uh, experience uh, with your dad too because you know on top of the great movie it's also that movies bind relationships you know yeah exactly so that's pretty cool that you had that experience all right so um, what do you this is, won't take too long to sidetrack but what do you guys know of Arabian Nights the whole source material for I love it I think it's so great the, I've like, never the read it right I've never read it, yeah. but I've always wanted to, but I haven't. Yeah, same. Right. I know the tale, like, someone's going to, I think a storyteller has to tell, like, either the king or a princess, you know, a thousand tales in a thousand days, and they all have to be different, otherwise right. they're going to cut his head off, and that's... A thousand tells, and one. Yeah, a thousand and one stories. Arabian Nights. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, Diane, you want to summarize that for us? Well, it was a uh, a woman who had to entertain a man of power, and he she was threatened with death unless she was able to come up with, as you said, a different story for a thousand and one nights. What a woman! Really? No kidding. Yeah, yeah I forgot it was a woman. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. <laughs> yes. So I actually had to read that recent, not the whole thing, but I'll give you some background on it. Um, it's it's actually a compilation of many, many stories. It's oh. like a, a few thousand pages or something ridiculous like that. And so the framing device for this uh, uh, Arabian Nights concept is that there is a, uh, a king uh, ruler, uh, 
uh, Shariar and his wife, uh, Shahrazad, and the framing device. Yeah. She, so what happens, like, he had a first wife and she cheated on him. And so she, uh, and so the king had her killed. And then now she's try she married a, uh, she, and so he's been marrying uh, new wives. And after the wedding night, she would kill the wife off every single time. And so she, she, so he goes through a few wives. He would marry, marry her and then kill her, marry her and kill her because now he feels like he's jaded because his first wife cheated on him. And so he's been just g going on a massive killing spree. <laughs> so Crazy. until this one time, you know, she finds this uh, girl or a wife or whatever. And she's now, uh, she recognizes and realizes this conceit. And so, so, so she, in order to save her li own life, she basically every night she's telling this husband a story, hence a thousand and one nights where she keeps delaying the inevitable uh, hmm. to prevent her from being killed. And so um, the three most popular uh, mythology associated with this, there's three separate storylines. It's Aladdin's Wonderful Lamp, uh, Ali Baba and mm -hmm. the Four Thieves, The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor. All three of those, the most popular ones, are actually not part of the Arabian Nights original. All right, because no kidding. They, they were added on, you know, centuries later. No kidding. And even if after being added on, this this entire collection, uh, uh, all were basically compiled by Westerners. Uh, the actual Middle Easterners, they don't really care about the story. If you go there today, they're not like. They're not like super proud of you know, the foundational literature of the area. No, I mean, yeah. it's not like they, 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 it's not like, you know, how, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the Greek, Greek and Roman culture of today, or if you go to Greece, they'll, they're kind of proud of their own mythologies, you know, yeah. their yeah. own histories. Well, it's not the Shakespeare you know, of England. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you go to like uh, Middle East, they're just like, they kind of shun this as kind of idolatry. Now, I have a question. So, because, yes. and I've been waiting for the opportunity to ask, are you saying that the, Ara the T Arabian Nights tales are, are many different authors? Oh, yeah. It's, mul it's, it's basically a collection of mythologies, multiple oh, no mythologies. Kidding. And so the, that's the whole story frame is that you have this wife uh, or this uh, new newlywed, the husband and wife character with that history you just now know of. And then this woman is spinning tales. And each tale... Uh, is a thousand and one tales. Each tale is a night, and each night is one section of the tale, and each tale has its own okay. separate tale. Who tales. created? Who, but did one person create that framework? Oh, um, it's been uh, attributed to some storytellers, uh, Westerners, uh, and Antoine Galat or Hanadia. But but these are just people who collected the stories. They heard it from other people in the region. They're like. It's so sort of no like, one you know, took credit for putting it together with that format. No, because think about like the Odyssey, right? We we think the person is um, what's his name, Homer, right? Homer. Yeah, Homer. But yeah. potentially it could be a collection of because it was an oral tradition. Whoever memorized the story would pass it on orally to the next person and on and on oh, and on. I see. Wow. That was their job, and uh -huh. it was the same. It, it, a lot of people in ancient times did the same because people weren't you know writing down stuff, right? So wow. And just like that, that's how the, all of the Arabian night stories came to pass. And then somebody yeah. finally, uh, uh, many people probably ultimately translate it. And it has a lot of roots, not wow. just Arabic, but Persian, Indian, Greek, Jewish, Turkish cultures all over the place. It's not, it's not a singular monolithic uh, culture, although there are a lot of Persian influences in wow. itself in there. And there's Pretty cool. a lot of stuff with Indian culture. Anyways. The reason I wanted to give some of that background is because um, the this movie is actually tack, it it uh, it actually strips elements from the three most popular ones, which was part of the original collection. Right, the Latin I know. Story, the Ali Baba and Forty Thieves is probably the biggest influence. And then the so in the beginning of the movie, you know, we find out Ahmed is the uh, the thief character. He is very similar to Ali Baba. And the Forty Thieves yeah. storyline. Yeah. And then he goes okay. on an, an adventure, which is more like Sinbad, because Sinbad has to 
go through the 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 seven six or seven voyages exactly and then you know there are all these magical uh elements of not the lamp there there's no lamp but there's uh, um uh, the magic dust and the and box so, yeah so it it does oh and the princess and stuff like that that the, the marrying and the princess element so that's yeah. so that's from Milan. so there he's kind of pulling elements carpet. Yeah, so he's pulling elements from a variety of Arabian I, night tales. I felt like that when I was watching. I was like, I suspected that. That was kind of like <laughs> it's like a distillation, right? It's not yeah. a uh, a direct uh, adaptation off of any one of the single myth- mythologies, mytho- mythological elements from the Arabian tales. But just like Mark of Zorro, like you know, the way that uh, you know he did Zorro, he put such a big stamp on it and I feel like he's he, he put his own stamp on what was a classic mythology of the Arabian Nights into his own material I feel like it's singularly unique that's really all I want to say is talking about the Arabian Nights it's like a singular sort of uh, Douglas Fairbanks creation that's distilled from something that's uh, from the classic realm you know uh, that that part I find very interesting because you take these classic influences and kind of uh, distill it into the elements that obviously, you know, makes them look the best. But also beyond that, it's just like artistically, it's kind of fascinating to to take all these tales and create a singular story out of out of them. You know, I don't think anybody's even done that today in modern movies to take these classic tales and put their own unique spin on it in the way that he's doing it. You know what I mean? Anyways, that's all I wanted to touch upon with regard to the Arabian tales or Arabian nights. Um, but moving on, um, overall, uh, what do you guys think of the, the uh, epic, epic adventure? Let's start with uh, you, Bob. Oh, I, I love it. I love it. I thought, I thought, I agree with Lily. It, 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 it's, a, it's a bit elaborate and probably it's, I don't know how to put it. It would be overworded if it were a novel, but. That's a good way to put it. It would, it would be overworded if it was a novel. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I still, I, st- it's, I, I it, get, it gets a, a note of grace from me on that because I love it so much. That's a long movie for a six-year-old boy to sit through. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that. Uh, I, so if you want Mormon, your you know, attention was exactly where it needed to be, right you on know, that screen. I I've I've loved movies since I was a kid, and I always, even since I was a little kid, when TV shows were on, I would say to my parents, "Why do they have to be so short? Why don't they make them longer?" Hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's just. I guess the way I, I always liked I I I have since I was a little kid I've always loved really long movies I love it when they're like two hours three hours long. Wow, really? Yeah. Well, you got some says, <laughs> if you make a movie that's over eighty-eight minutes, you've made it too long. Oh, I hate if those standards. Look, <laughs> yeah. So if you look back on his movies, they're not that long. It just depends yeah. on what you're pleased in. Yeah. Well, for the masses, I, I can understand having the standards. But for me, if they're making movies for me, make them long. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think, Diane? What do you think of the Thief of Baghdad? How's that rank in your uh, Douglas Fairbank works uh, out of all of them? Out of all of them, it's my second favorite of all of his films. I have a special place in my heart for The Gaucho. Oh, I want to see that. What's the story behind that? Oh, marvelous film. Um, Why do you think that one was a far superior film than this one, is the question. Well, it's just a different approach. There's uh, a spiritual aspect to it oh. and there's even a part where he is contemplating committing suicide so it gets very dark and you never see this sort of 
attitude happening in uh, Douglas Fairbanks. I know I can get out of this alive. Mm -hmm. sort of so, so you're saying it's a lot more like movie. mature performance compared to the, all his other previous movies, right? Yes, I do. I do. He's acting more uh, without acting like Douglas Fairbanks. I mean, he has his moments. I mean, he is Douglas Fairbanks. You're not going to change that. But his chemistry uh, with Lupe Velez as his uh, sort of love interest is very um, turbulent, but it's also very funny. And he puts a mixture into that film of humor, of spirituality, of a love interest, of action, um, it's it's not just a mixed bag. It's more than that. It's very well put together. But I also think that the Thief of Baghdad is also well put together for what it's, what it's trying to be, and I think that it makes it. I think it's just most magical of all of his films. Mm. And the magic is real. You can't forget, even as a kid, like Bob, how magical it really is. I sort of wish they would bring that back to the big screen and let uh, have kids in the audience with their parents and see what they think of it. Yeah. Because it's just so darn good. Yeah, it takes a private theater like the Somerville Theater, a uh, local theater that uh, can do what it wants, you know? Right. But I, I did take a picture of Fairbanks um, from the Gaucho, a promotional picture from the Gaucho off the internet today. And I think it might have been from your site. <laughs> it was like sepia. It was a sepia tone photo. Yes, yes. That's something recent that somebody posted, and I just yeah. love that portrait. Me too. I saved it. I took it off and said, oh, man, I got to have this picture. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. That's that's very kind words. So, Lily, what do you think? Um, watching the whole movie, it really is a spectacle. You know, because you have all of the technology that they were using at the time to make it just seem more mystical and imaginative. You know, they have the flying carpet ride on, like, not CG, but, you know, these is it if they superimpose it or they double expose it? I forget which one's which. Yeah, it's <laughs> optical it, effects. Optical it's effects, yeah. Visual, yeah. So they have, you know, the that and the horse. I laughed when I they had the Pegasus. I don't know why I shouldn't have. I just thought it was so silly. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Douglas Fairbanks riding to get his um, invisibility cloak, which even that was pretty cool because I don't really understand how they were able to make him so he twirls into a tornado under the cloak when he's going to save the princess at the end but thinking about what they did techni technologically i was like what did they you know they do obviously the actors acted like they were getting attacked but still i was just i was just probably another optical trick but you know in that respect seeing that for the first time and something like that has never been done before on such a large scale it's no wonder this movie was so well received. Plus, Douglas Fairbanks is handsome and you know jolly. He seems like a happy guy. <laughs> you you instantly love his character, and you know the wonders that are in this movie. Since I mean, I don't know how well known the Arabian Nights stories were back in the twenties, a hundred years ago, but mm. I feel like we all know about it even now. So I'm assuming people knew the gist of what they were back then. Possibly. I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, it, yeah, it's been in, uh, it got translated into English uh, from 1700s. Something like oh, that. okay. So yeah, so it has been around. around. Yeah, since even Shakespearean times. So it's very well known hmm. by then. It sort of has a Harryhausen touch when he um, conjures these thousands of extras from just throwing powder. Yeah, that was fun. And yeah. all of a sudden, that was pretty wild. When I yep. saw that, I thought, wow, this is really overwhelming. 
So I found that very interesting, you know, mm. and that, of course, is all done in the camera. Um, now we've got CGI doing it, you know, for us. And uh, that's what makes these silent films so incredible to me. Mm. I will say, too, because, you know, we know it has a higher budget. I, once again, the costumes were great. You know, the princess looked fabulous. Everyone from oh. the Mongol society looked, you know, great as well. It's, you know, in the desert, but still, they all have the right, you know, they're yeah. all dressed in the right garments at the time. Oh, it's beautiful. Not. I also liked uh, when the princes were coming, the, the Mongol prince, I loved his pagoda when he entered, even though he's supposed to be the bad guy. I was like, yes, he knows how to live it up. <laughs> <laughs> I agree totally. I don't know what else I felt about this film. Uh, even though it was a longer, I wish I could have sat straight through it at regular speed. I did bump it up a little bit, you know, at first, but then eventually I had to really speed it up. Mm. But, uh, oh, yeah, I also... So when Douglas Fairbanks is going on his quest, in a sense, too, which, you know, likens it back to Aladdin going into the cave of the tiger i forget to going to get the genie lamp it's when he was underwater i couldn't figure out how exactly they did that unless he was actually being filmed underwater swimming any, any, I, anyone no. have any idea about that well that's a slow motion that's it is a slow motion. Yeah. Oh, okay. he was also on a rope clearly yeah so you you guys then uh the print on youtube is uh a little blocky because um uh, the resolution's pretty low, uh, but I have the I have the DVD or Blu-ray copy, and when I project it on my big screen, I, you can see those ropes. If you zoom in a little bit, like you can actually see the the, the you can see the seams <laughs> of the visual okay. effects. Interesting. Yeah, so that, 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 it happens yeah. a lot with classic silent films like that. Like we were just yeah. talking about uh, Buster Keaton and um, what was it? Uh, what was the last one that we reviewed? The well, Steve Mobile Jr. Yes, that one where uh, you could see that the the, uh, the ropes or whatever they they used to break apart their houses at the end. But you oh, need yeah, you a that. good yeah you need a, a a good like DVD print where it's like higher resolution or Blu-ray, and then also mm -hmm. you need a big screen. And once you have both, you you usually at least for me I can spot those uh those problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I definitely saw the strings at the end of the film when uh, he and the princess were on, and it was like a really cool shot where they were sw actually swinging above the crowd. But <laughs> depending yeah. on the the way the sunlight hit the the fish lines, I was like, yeah. hey. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because, but you know, seeing it now, it is kind of funny. But if you actually <laughs> go back, going back to that underwater scene, uh, they actually use this not exactly the same, but conceptually. A uh, similar technique with uh, the shape of water. Do you remember the the? Oh yeah, I watched that. Yeah, so that movie, which was on uh, Best Picture a few years ago, uh, Del Toro didn't shoot most of the underwater scenes using underwater. I don't know if you knew that. So hmm. in that whole movie, a lot of it takes place underwater because it's about underwater creature and stuff. Yeah. And there are so many scenes where the camera is, appears as if it's going underwater, and the characters are underwater. Guess, you know, guess what? That technique was used here, right? You know, <laughs> Interesting. 80 to 100 years ago, you know, uh, Douglas Fairbanks and company already did it. You know, that's the beauty of, like I said, I've been saying, you know, silent films, so many film techniques, even though they didn't have actual computer, uh, you know, to, to erase those uh, lines, right? Those, those, yeah. uh, those, uh, those things that hold the... Uh, effects up but it, it's still like the concept hasn't changed you know in decades and hundreds of years you know yeah and it's already been established because exactly. i assumed uh when i did because i like i said i kept having to speed and slow down the film to make sure i could watch the whole thing through during the water scene too i just i assumed they were using cross fans to kind of get that billowy effect on his pants <laughs> right so I mean, now I'm curious to know how they did the shape of water in that respect. You know, what 
if they, because <laughs> I haven't seen that for a few years myself either. Um, if they had used cross fans on the girl and uh, <laughs> what's his name, Doug Jones playing the monster. <laughs> yep. I mean, the technique is still, you know, obviously has improved over the years, but the concept is going to be the same, you know, and so. Also, I don't know if you guys spotted uh, Anime Wong, which is one of the one or handful of uh, well-known uh, Asian American stars in the silent film era. But well, she fucked her out of uh, Peter Pan. Yes, so she was the to give her a chance to really be in a very big production. Although she was very good in both those films. Yep. And it gave her a lot of uh, exposure. She was the Mongol spy. Yep. She was the Mongol spy. Yeah. yeah. Which you know, unfortunately, and she was is absolutely kind of the... beautiful. Which unfortunately is I the. I thought she was hotter than the princess myself. Uh, I too. But I, I think that, I think that's what I mean. Is like the it, that's pro- part of the problems of the era of silent films we watch. Sometimes just like uh, there are elements of this film where it's like you know, of course the Asians are the racists, right? I mean, the, the, mm-hmm. the Asians not the racist, but the Asians are the um, the, the villains, villains, right? Yeah, which is like right. interesting, you know. It some of them doesn't some story elements doesn't always age well, you know, but. But unfortunately, it was well, kind of the. How do you a... feel about this characterization? Does is it offensive to you? Does it remind you of uh, just the usual thing that goes on with uh, projecting Asians on the screen, or were you able to disconnect and give her her part? Um, I'm just wondering what you think about that. Well, it's sort of like Broken Blossom, right? D.W. Griffith is very similar. They're all, they're, it's a product of its time. So I, because I'm steeped in silent film and I know that's history, I know what the context is and I can understand how they went about it production wise and how things happen, right? Uh, and of course, we always have, you know, 100 years now, almost 100 plus years of history looking back, right? And have you using modern sensitivity to look back on it you know what i mean right so that's that's gonna be that way for a lot of a lot of works uh, you know almost a big big pieces of uh literature you know music tv film whatever you can think of you know any any artistic medium whatever context was created it's gonna have these problems you know it's it, it's only made in the limit of its time at that period of time you know does that make sense? Yes. So, I mean, they, even today, um, you can still watch movies where Asian are not portrayed in a positive manner, but that's like 2020. It's still happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you can look back right. on that 50 years from now and, you know, in 2070 and go, oh, back in the old days of 2020. <laughs> They weren't as progressive as they were, were they? <laughs> and I think I think it's with that same eye in 2020, we look back in 20, 1924 and go, uh, in some ways, the certain parts of the industry was pro- progressive, right? Up until the 1920s, where more than half of the, you know, movers and shakers in filmmaking were women, right? So many of them, right? Lois Weber's and on and on. There's just so many. And so there are certain aspects of film industry were very progressive in that respect. But, you know, certainly elements like this. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to feel about it. I, it's one of those like, if if I were per, if I placed myself back in the day in 1924, that was the only thing you could watch. There's really no other alternative, right? <laughs> Did you ever see uh, The Toll of the Sea with Anime no. Wong? I haven't seen that yet, no. What's interesting about that film is that it's uh, like a version of Madame Butterfly, and it's an all-Asian cast, right. except for her lover, who is a uh, an officer in the uh, Navy. But I found that very interesting that no one was dressed up uh, Caucasian as an Asian. Right. 
And um, you might want to watch that. I'd love to hear your feedback on that film. She did an excellent job. And um, she's the star, absolutely the star of that film. Yeah, she's quite, she's had an interesting career. Uh, there's a recent documentary uh, on PBS called Asian American, just uh, kind of in the first episode talking about uh, Haiza Kamasawa, the actor, as well as this one, Mae Wong, and how what kind of challenges they had in early Hollywood, you know. So, anyway, uh, it, it drives me nuts because you know it doesn't matter what your uh, orientation is. If you're beautiful, just let them do their job. <laughs> yeah. She was almost cast for a, a film, then um, didn't I forgot what that movie was? But the good, the good earth. Yes, that's the movie. So. Oh, uh, she wanted that part so very much. Yes, that's exactly right. So ended up going to... And they to, gave it to a Caucasian actress yeah. who actually won the Academy Award for it. And I hate that. What yeah. is that movie? The Good Earth. That's uh, 1931. Oh, this is the book. No, 1937. 37, yeah. That's when they did the adaptation. That's right. What's... Uh, I know we're getting off topic, but what, what, it, what exactly is it about? Um, Pearl Buck wrote about her uh, experiences in China. And oh, <laughs> yeah, that's bad. <laughs> she ha gave the rights to make a movie out of it. Palm Muni played the uh, Asian role of the star, and um, uh, Louis I Rainer. Louis Rainer. Liz Reiner, yes, yeah. she played uh, the part that Anna Mae Wong should have got. That's right. Who would have been perfect for that role. Mm -hmm. And she lobbied nice. for it very, very hard. Yes. And um, that her losing that part really crushed her spirit. That's right. And, um, you know, she tried to go to China to be in the theater there and they thought she was too American. <laughs> or in America, they thought because she was born in America. Chinese. She's born in America, yeah. That's right, and she couldn't get a break. Yeah. She just Crazy. couldn't get a break. And I think that uh, it made her health suffer mentally and uh, physically. She's born in LA. She was born in LA. Yeah. Anyways, so that's a long sidetrack, but um, it, you know, it it's you know looking back today, modernize with these films when they're portraying that, but even modern movies, I'd say you, it's sometimes cringeworthy when they have these portrayals like that. But you know, it's just like you know how how much have we progressed versus how much is we have to go, you know, looking back on history, both both now and then, you know what I mean. Yeah, agreed. It's, it's definitely a lot better, that's for sure, but only by small degrees. I think that there's still some some ways to go. So, yeah. Anyways, back into the movie itself. Um, the what what do you guys think of the? You mentioned uh, uh, Ray Housen's sort of effect. There was these monsters towards the end where he has the battle, but there was like a bat or something that came out of the woodwork and then there were some sea creatures and what do you think of all those creatures he has to conquer to get the to the for next the, level kind for of the funny. times it was great pretty bloody oh yeah i love that <laughs> i thought that was fair. i thought it was great the way they did the spider the way the sword went to the spider and then they used like a a sand or a lightweight powder coming out to look like blood. I thought that was oh, great. Yeah. underwater, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, fantastic. It was. He also cause... went after a dragon and gave it a couple of stabs, and I thought, "Wow, a dragon fighter!" <laughs> and uh, I was very impressed with that as well. But it showed that he wasn't shy about using violence in his films. He branded that sword when he had to. Yep. Hmm. 
I was uh, quite disturbed in the first part of the movie when he robbed this uh, fellow openly and did a little magic trick by taking the, the objects out of the bag to to say that the bag was empty. It was great that he had the sleight of hand, so that's what it showed. But it was it, it was disturbing. I was like, oh, this is he really is a thief. He really is a bad guy, you know? Yeah. Of course, he was redeemed uh, he by love. Street. He knew what, where, what was where and what was what. Sorry, come again, Diane? You, you cut out there for a second. Oh, I was just saying that he knew the streets of Baghdad, and he lived on them, and he learned to survive on the streets. That's he got his good. food, he got his clothing, he got his money, he got all of his stuff. Mm. Not just by sleight of hand, but just knowing where he lived. Mm -hmm. Not uh, unlike the back streets that we see in some movies where people live out outside. I thought it did have a thematic connection to sort of the Mongol prince because uh, what I want, I take as the theme of the uh, Ahmed character, which is the, the thief character that he plays, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then if you, it cuts to, at some point, the Mongol prince, and basically he wants back that, and he basically says the same thing as, what I want, mm -hmm. I take. I love which it. Which I, I felt like there was some sort of a, 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 a thematic link between that character and kind of the villain, I guess, of the of the film. Yeah, absolutely. Where they're both in the same place, where they were just... it. Uh, without thinking about any anybody else or hurting anybody else or any of those consequences, uh, what they want, they take. And so I think that's the whole transformation, I think, is why I think he uh, had this character go on a journey with the whole uh, imam, the sort of spiritual you know, person, which the first encounter of the 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 mosque or something he goes into was like, you know, nothing is real. I take what I want. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in charge. The holy man, you know, and uh, who, who, you know, extends his arm still, regardless. And then, once he quote unquote discovers love, that's when he returns back to the holy man to say, uh, you know, his own uh, actions or consequences have led him into a. Uh, his choices in life, right, <laughs> ha have uh, led him into the end of kind of his own uh, self where he has to give Rejection. give himself up to this uh, holy man characteristic, which then directed him on a quest. Uh, a quest to, I guess the, the purpose of that is to make him a prince at the end of which he'll get the pixie dust or something, and he becomes a prince, right? That's kind of the goal of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, it's also a theme of redemption. Right. Here he's done all this, you know, thievery and trickery, and uh, the Mongol prince does nothing like that. He's just pure evil. Right. right exactly. But uh, Ahmed is not pure evil. He's got a heart. Right. So that's the, that's the, the whole soul. contrast between both. So, because the other element of the Mongol prince was that he got that apple and then he used it on the un unsuspecting um, uh, uh, sailor or somebody who's near yeah. the port. It's just like, you know, outright killed him and make sure the apple works by reviving him. <laughs> Guinea pig. Yeah. Yeah, that was a little tricky. Yep. I thought that was a really interesting sort of deep cut of this film where you, there is definitely the adventure piece, right? It's very entertaining, very large spectacle. But then underneath that, there is this story element that also rings true, right? Of this hero who does go on a hero's journey, you know, literally in the Joseph Campbell way, right? And if you do good, you will succeed. 
Right. <laughs> and love conquers all. Of course. Naturally. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> a lot of wind uh, it might be Bob's microphone yeah gonna... I got my window open because yeah sorry about that anyways we, we can wrap it up um, unless you guys have anything else to add to this uh, spectacle epic well I sound. think this was a very fine podcast uh, Yi Fang it was just really marvelous we covered a lot of ground you have any? You guys have any uh, parting thoughts before we uh, head off on the film? See you back at Baghdad. Um, how, how about for you, Bob and Lily? Uh, between Robin Hood and this one, which one would you pick? <laughs> uh, which one do I like better? This one. For the character, I'd say Robin Hood. Oh yeah. The, yeah, I don't know. Just comparing the Douglas Fairbanks, you know, like you mentioned the puck character yeah. that definitely fits the type for robin hood better than i thought the thief of baghdad right. even if he is kind of like this peddling thief who is very playful i just felt it suited better for robin hood yeah because but, well he's also he, kind but of did he go on a journey i can't remember it's been a while now robin did, hood yeah no. did he actually change as a result the course through the course of the film no I guess not. Yeah, that's that's kind of kind of why I like this one better because he actually, like we were just talking about, went on a a journey of transformation, Redemption. his identity yeah. exactly. So, yeah. So for me, I, I kind of like this one better. Yeah. Yeah. But, but way back to uh, Diane's earlier point was just everything about this, from you know the the acting of everyone but also the visual effects the music uh of the print we saw the carl davis score was amazing i, I thought um to the set pieces the costumes just visual effects everything is phenomenal it's it's a massive epic movie you know it's very special yep and i think eventually you should show it to your kids oh yeah sure absolutely how old is your boy now? He's six. Okay. The same as, as it would be the same as as you. Yeah. If, you, if we show it now, see if we back that. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing terribly objectionable in it, you know. It's like. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, All right. It might, it might be different for me than your son. I mean, the fact that I was brought up to a theater, you got the popcorn, you know, with my dad, and he's just. You know, special event kind of thing. Yeah, well, all the theaters are closed now. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't, you there's don't not a lot of alternatives. Yeah, you don't have that option, I'm afraid. <laughs> the only uh, positive, I guess, is that uh, we do have a projector at home, so it it it's, it doesn't have the audience, but the uh, it's I think for him pretty big. So hey, we'll that's watch... kind of cool, actually. Yeah, we watch a fair yeah, amount of I movies. I think just sitting with your parents is a special occasion to watch these films. Yeah. It stays in their memory. Yeah, my my boy really loves trains and stuff. So he, any Buster Keaton, he his face lights up because obviously Buster Keaton and trains, right, or houses or any right of the toys that he likes to play with. I mean, it, it's it has a one to one uh, correlation, I think. Uh, I got it. Which interest? The general. <laughs> oh, he's he loves the general. Yeah. But we have to cut out like the first half of the movie and just go straight to the train, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't care about all this stuff. Just give me the, the train. <laughs> so <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. All right, folks. Last thoughts on the Thief of Baghdad before we wrap up. No. Nope. Uh, I need to read more stories <laughs> from the Arabian Tales. Yeah. It's uh yeah it's um it's like thousands of pages so if you want to actually finish the whole thing <laughs> it's quite a long task <laughs> worth it <laughs> yeah Burton I think Richard Burton or I forgot the first name but Burton something is the guy that translated it is the most popular uh, not maybe not the most popular but he's one of the first translators I think that popularized it um, from the one thousand or something or before that thousand Arabian Nights. 
No, I mean 1000 AD, and there's oh, like, I see. He, he did eight volumes, I think, and they're about three, four hundred pages each, or five hundred, depending on which uh, font you get. Uh, and since then, there's been at least like something like three to four or five other translators, and they all came out with different volume and page count for each. But wow, they all cover about the same things, I think. <laughs> so it's a very massive amount of work uh, in terms of reading it. So just the FYI. It's sort of like Shakespeare. If you like Shakespeare, you can read it, but not everybody. Yeah, Shakespeare is a tough one because uh, the only way I can get through it is if I listen to audiobooks professionally done because everyone has a different voice besides my own. <laughs> yeah, but really drama, stage stuff, you want to watch it like the way it's meant to be. But, um, but these Arabian Nights is one of those things where you, you kind of – because it came from oral tradition, you almost want to listen to it as well, because that's how it was for thousands of years is the, the stories have been told, you know, orally. So it'd be interesting to hear a, sort of a, a narrator, a good narrator to tell you the stories. But anyways. All right, folks, let's uh, wrap it up here. Um, you can find more of our stuff at watching silent films, plural, dot wordpress .com. Again, that's watching silent films dot wordpress .com. You can send us an email with thoughts, comments, or questions or anything at watching silent films, plural, at gmail.com. And again, as I said before, to leave a comment or a star rating on Apple Podcasts or any other place that you find our podcast here. And uh, where can we find more of your stuff, Diane? You can find it on Facebook. The silence majority goes way back. And uh, I was sort of missed your announcement that you usually make on a weekly basis to let us know when you're going to have your podcast, because I've been looking for it. Because I want to hear what I sounded like. Oh, uh, to post it? Yeah, we, we, we kind of take our time editing it. So when we're when it's out, we'll send you a link. So don't worry about that part. Okay, great. It comes out. We, we don't really hard. have like a we don't have like a schedule where I guess it's for the listeners too. We don't have one where we're going to be like every Monday something comes out. It's like when we get around to it, it'll be out. So be patient with great. us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Um, any... But once it's posted, it stays up. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. That's so that that'll conclude our podcast for today. So thank you, uh, Bob and Lily, and thank you, Diane, for uh, uh, reappearing as a guest tonight as well. And uh, thank you very much for participating. And then to all, a good night, listeners and everyone. Thank you.